All right. So hi, everybody. Welcome to our SVGI webinar, A Framework for Success, Facilitating Effective Sexual Assault Response Teams. My name is Sarah Florman, and I am the Sexual Assault Response Team Project Coordinator at the Sexual Violence Justice Institute, which is part of the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault. And what I do in my role is work with multidisciplinary teams across the US and territories that are working on their um, collaborative response to sexual violence in local communities. So with my grant, I work with um, ICJR grantees, rural folks, and also STOP grantees. Um, and we do kind of, I, I could talk about this in a minute, but we talk, we do a lot of training and technical assistance and support around um, collaboration, teaming, uh, systems response, et cetera. Perfect. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Fatima Hayoma. I go by she, her pronouns, and I am one of the rural project coordinators at the Sexual Violence Justice Institute at Minkasa. So my primary role is to provide training and technical assistance to SARTs that are in rural areas. Um, so I work primarily with rural grantees. Um, I work very closely with Sarah, so we do a lot of trainings and technical assistance together. Um, so you'll likely see both of us um, throughout the year. Um, just some quick background information. My background is in social work and gender, women's, and sexuality studies, and I've just been doing work in this movement for about six years. So the objectives of this webinar today are to identify the factors that affect team success, to describe and talk about some of these successful problem-solving strategies, and to share some insights and lessons that we've learned from our work with multidisciplinary teams. First, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the Sexual Violence Justice Institute. Um, or SVJI, we are a national training and technical assistance provider, um, and we use a systems change approach to support communities in improving the systems response and the outcomes for victim survivors of sexual violence. So we really do talk a lot about collaboration, interdisciplinary communication, um, protocol development, et cetera. Things that we do within SVJI are to provide training. Um, training can include things like webinars, workshops, conferences, special topics. Um, we have often gone to folks um, will invite us to their SART meeting to do a presentation on, um, you know, an introduction to protocol development or, you know, SART 101 for new teams or something like that. We develop resources and some of those resources can be things like fact sheets, toolkits and guidebooks. Um, we've got some templates or sample documents that we use. Um, and then Fatima, as part of the rural program, has a blog called the Rural Realities blog that um, comes out, is it month, is it weekly or monthly, Fatima? Uh, weekly every Wednesday. Great, thank you. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can always sign up on our website. Um, it's a great blog, it's really useful. We also provide support and that can be whatever it needs to be. So we sometimes work with team coordinators just on brainstorming um, when there's issues within the team, problem solving that needs to be done. Um, we help train on meeting facilitation, et cetera. So we're kind of there for whatever you need. Um, and another thing that we think is really important uh, that we do within SVJ is make connections. So we really strive to provide teams with access to folks who are experts in their field, other technical assistance providers um, who are doing work, peers. So we like to connect teams with each other um, and potential mentors. So folks that are starting newer teams to connect them to folks who've had some successes um, in maybe similar communities. And we do a number of, we do this in a number of ways, um, probably the most the most straightforward one is um, right now we're doing monthly connection calls. Um, some of you may have attended those where we just invite um, folks, grantees from all over to meet with us um, for about an hour a month just to talk about whatever's going on in your communities, to learn from each other, to ask questions. Um, it helps us to understand what's going on on the ground so that we can provide you with better resources. 
it's also a really good opportunity for folks to get to know each other um, and to gain some wisdom from folks in other communities. When SPJI talks about our work, we talk about all of these, all of these different uh, components that really make up this, the victim-centered approach. Um, you'll see from this that we've got individual practices, agency policies, systems, procedures, and interagency collaborations. And all of those are surrounding the victim survivor experience, which we really try to keep at the center of our work. So with individual practices, that's where we're focusing on what each and every individual who responds to sexual violence disclosure does when they're working with a victim survivor. So everything from taking the 911 call to, um, you know, a victim showing up in a in an emergency room. Um, a lot of times teams like to start or focus on these areas. A lot of times that's where um, really obvious problems crop up, right? When there are issues with an individual response, um, the way that somebody worked with a victim or the way that they didn't, um, things that go wrong tend to happen on the individual level. Um, but we, we also really wanna encourage folks to think about every individual who responds um, kind of on all fronts regardless and really understanding what's going well, what's not, um, what can we do differently? Like how can, we, how can we fix the things that we are seeing that need to be fixed and how can we um, use our successes to improve in other areas? So really looking at, um, how each one of us as part of this can be just striving always to do it a little bit better. When you're moving towards um, agency policies and we're thinking about the written expectations and guidelines for folks within their organization or agency. So again, we're still asking those same questions. What's going well with that agency? What's not going so well? How can we be working to improve things? Um, the agency policy level really does require that buy-in from leadership. Um, this can be an area that can be really challenging and sometimes take a little bit of extra time, um, but it also results in some lasting changes because you're, you're putting practices into um, kind of into print, right? You're making, you're making something um, permanent that way. The next piece is systems procedures. So that is really how, how all the related agencies that create a single system operate. And what I mean by that is you might in your community have two or three different law enforcement agencies. You might have a couple of hospitals. You might have more than one advocacy agency. So how do all of the individual agencies within that discipline work together? Um, there might be a time where you've got multiple law enforcement jurisdictions that all have a slightly different way of handling an alcohol facilitated sexual assault, for example. Um, so when you're talking about systems change and collaboration, you're really talking about getting those folks aligned with each other. Um, and then the final one is interagency collaboration. And that is really, um, it's, it's, it's the hardest part, but it's also, I think, the most important part when you're talking about the victim survivor experience, really looking at how are agencies working together? How are you all communicating with each other? How are you um, collaborating across differences, across, um, you know, different philosophies, different goals, um, different ideas of success? Um, there might be there might be long-standing grudges or um, past histories between agencies where um, things might have happened that have kind of halted um, communication or collaboration. So how do you bridge those gaps? How do you work with each other to um, kind of overcome all that with the goal of really trying to be there and provide the best care that you can for that victim? Um, and again, with all of these areas, keeping in mind, thinking about all of, all of these things, what is going well, what's not, and how do we take action on that? 
So what we're going to talk about primarily today um, is the 10 factor framework for SART effectiveness. And this is a report that SBGI put out um, that took some research um, and really honed in on some of the key pieces um, that SART leaders across the US felt um, were really key to a good team. So SRGI interviewed about 17 SARTs across the country between 2015 and 2016. And the teams were asked about internal and external factors um, that can help facilitate success. So with all of those interviews, um, we came to a consensus on about 10 factors. There are six internal and four external factors, and we're going to talk about each of those in a little more detail today. So for the systems-focused SART, um, the internal factors that were identified were a shared vision and model, diverse membership, multi-level leadership, creating a culture of learning, continual improvement, and an emphasis on relations and teamwork. The external factors, which are the factors that uh, need to happen kind of outside of the, the team itself, are involvement from individual SART members, having supportive member agencies, having access to resources and networking, and then having that community support and input. All right. So the first factor we're gonna talk about is a shared vision and model. Um, ideally, all members of the team should be agreeing on both the model and the vision of the team. So when we're talking about the vision of a team, um, it's a lot like a mission statement, right? It's what are your aspirations? What are your goals? What is this team hoping to accomplish? What is the purpose and scope of your team's work? And then what is the intended impact? When we're talking about team models, that's gonna include things like team structure, who the leadership is, and the purpose and scope of the team's work. When you take all of these factors and you really put some thought into them, you will, um, you'll see that there's a lot of really, some of them are obvious and some of them are less obvious, positive outcomes. So some of the things that this can do for you um, is to really increase and improve role clarity in the team. Um, it, it can help reduce intra-team confusion and conflict. And it can really help to clarify the purpose of the team um, and that can really improve member and community engagement. And you might or might not see that my cat has decided to visit our webinar today. So sorry about that. When you look at this diagram, you'll see SART A. Um, so SART A and SART B are two different types of SARTs. When we are um, working with teams in SVGI, we are typically talking about uh, SART A, which is a community-based systems changed SART. Um, and that is where you're talking about overall policies, practices, you're not talking about individual cases. SART B is one of those where you're working cooperatively on specific cases. So with SART A, um, the structure is often a formalized multidisciplinary team. And the leadership is traditionally a SART coordinator that is housed in one of the team's member agencies. Um, sometimes leadership is multi-level um, where there are roles for members from all of the different agencies. There are a number of different kinds of leadership models that folks can choose to have for their SART. Um, it really, what's gonna work best is dependent on each individual community. With systems change SARTs, a lot of times, um, again, the decision-making process is something that teams have to agree on together. Um, a very, I would say, typical process is team members contributing to decision-making with input from member agencies and community members. So a really collaborative decision-making process with input from everyone. All right. So we're going to do a Zoom poll real quick. And let me. Oh, we are not going to do a Zoom poll real quick because they didn't transfer over. Okay. 
So we're just going to put it in the chat, maybe, or just ask you to think about it a little bit. Does your team have a mission or vision statement? Do you have a formal decision making process? I apologize. We are there's a there's a few Zoom polls that we just won't be doing today. So just just know that ahead of time. Um, a lot of times when we talk about these things, you know, it it sometimes seems really obvious at the start. Oh, of course we we need to have a mission and vision. That seems really really straightforward. It's also something that sometimes teams, they get right into the meat of the work and they, they don't always take that initial step of really stopping to say, okay, but what is our goal here? What is our purpose? Um, the decision-making process, whether it's formal or not, um, again, it really will depend on your community, whether that matters. Um, some teams do just fine with informal decision-making, um, you know, coming to consensus, Etc. But knowing ahead of time what your process is can really be helpful when you run into those conflicts. Um, and when you've got a divided group. So the next internal factor that we're going to talk about is diverse membership. So we're talking about multidisciplinary collaboration. And that type of collaboration really takes into account all of the unique roles, unique and unique networks within your community. Um, multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary collaboration is intended to be mutually beneficial. So all of the members of a multidisciplinary team should be getting something out of this. Um, team members thinking beyond the boundaries of their own institutions and disciplines, everybody having their own experience and knowledge and bringing that to the table. A representation of all the core disciplines is really essential. Um, so making sure that you've got everybody at the table who is a part of the response, or at least inviting to the table, everyone who is part of the response. Um, it can also really help teams out to think a little bit outside the box when it comes to membership and really think about what community agencies and what groups and what, what types of services are your victim survivors needing outside of maybe the kind of primary ones that you'd automatically think of. A lot of times when we talk about this, we think about the law enforcement response, we think about prosecution, we think about um, sane nurses, but we aren't always thinking about some of those extra factors um, that are also affecting victim survivors. Things like food scarcity, housing needs, um, child care, all of those kind of extra pieces that can really be some of the more immediate needs that victim survivors are experiencing. So just thinking about um, kind of who else should be at the table that you haven't traditionally thought of. Um, what culturally specific service providers do you have in your communities? Um, you know, are, are you, are you working toward a system and a response that's gonna work for every survivor in your community? Again, so your team should reflect your community. And it's really important to um, have an understanding, not only just of the demographics of your community, but also what services are available, what types of, um, what types of programs do people use? What is needed? What does sexual violence look like in your community? Um, it's really important to ensure that you're getting everybody covered, right? That any survivor who walks into your, into your emergency room, into your precinct, into your office is able to be served by your response. Um, so there are a number of positive outcomes to this as well. Um, when you have good buy-in engagement with all the core disciplines, you're really, you're really getting to those gaps, right? You're really um, kind of, I'm losing my words today. You are, <laughs> you're making sure that uh, you're kind of 
closing those holes, um, the areas where victim survivors can fall through in the response, places where we lose folks. Um, you also get increased diversity of perspective and experience um, and also additional resources. So the more diverse your team membership, the more well-rounded you're gonna be, the more you're gonna be able to account for all potential situations, the more um, you're gonna be able to adapt to new situations that may come up because you're gonna have input from all of these different lenses. It's also, um, I'm sorry. Okay, so things that we want you to just consider, um, things that you're gonna wanna think about when it comes to this uh, diverse membership piece. Is your team representative of your community? And how do you know that? Um, you know, I think there are a lot of communities that may, may seem to be um, on the surface, a particular, a predominantly white community, for example, um, or a predominantly um, middle class community or something. And really, how do you know that you're reaching everybody? How do you know that what you see as typical is actually encompassing your whole community? Thinking about who else should be on your team, thinking about this constantly, um, before, during, and after, like, throughout the years of the team's existence, constantly be thinking about who's missing, who else could we add? And then how do you add new folks? So is this something where your meeting is open and everyone is invited to attend? Is it something that you um, invite people to a couple different times a year? How do you onboard new team members um, to make sure that they are understanding of what the purpose of the team is and what their role is? Um, some important things to think about. Okay, so the next internal factor is multi-level leadership. So while many SARTs um, might have a designated leader or typically a SART coordinator built into their current team structure and model, all team members and member agencies should really play a leadership um, role within the team. So why this is important is that one, it ensures that there's an equal distribution of power. Um, so, oops, there we click, no, there we go. Um, so it ensures that, no, you're good. Um, it ensures that there's an equal distribution of power. So while SART coordinators um, might be the ones organizing or facilitating team meetings um, or ensuring that you know, tasks are being met or completed, um, a SART coordinator really shouldn't be assuming or taking on all responsibility um, for leadership within the team. So it's kind of a constant balance between um, site coordinator leadership and then just overall team membership leadership. So what that can look like, so it might look like having co-facilitators um, or facilitators of subcommittees. So, it can mean that there are maybe different members within each meeting that lead the whole or larger team meeting. It could also mean having leads or um, heads of different projects. So an example that we use for this is maybe there's someone on your team that's really interested in evaluation, or maybe their primary role is in evaluation. Um, because they have that expertise or interest, maybe they can lead the subcommittee on evaluation. So there is kind of no one right way for leadership to be shared and the way that it's shared within your team should really be based on not only the strengths and uh, of your team members, but also the needs of your overall team. Um, the second thing that this ensures is that there's an acknowledgement of power imbalances between team members agencies and disciplines. So making sure that input from every member of the team is equally prioritized. Um, I think we'll talk about this in a later slide, but that also means um, input from the agencies that your members are part of. So actually at SVJI, we talk about this thing called the feedback loop, 
Um, and that really is talking about how a member is really attending a meeting on a behalf of their agency or discipline. So in order for agencies to be truly involved and have decision-making power within a team, that means that a member or that member should be going back to their agencies, sharing the information and work that's being done in the SART, and then also getting feedback to be able to bring back to the larger team. Um, additionally, um, there should be, um, you know, just overall consideration of all um, perspectives and knowledge. Um, some positive outcomes related to this, um, and some that I've mentioned already, but to just summarize it all, is that through, you know, focusing on this internal framework, you're one, able to incorporate the unique perspectives and knowledge of all team members and their respective disciplines. Um, two, you're dis also decreasing potential power imbalances and power hoarding that can occur within a team. Um, and then three, you're increasing overall engagement and buy-in from all members. And again, this comes from having input from people's agencies that they're coming from and also their overall disciplines that they might be representing. Um, additionally, you can gain um, support. When you gain support or have input and leadership with it from the member agencies, you're overall more able to implement the protocols or changes that your SART might be making. So I believe this is a Zoom poll as well, and I know we don't have Zoom polls. Um, so we'll just give you a few seconds to maybe type in the chat. Um, are power imbalances addressed on your teams? And maybe how are power imbalances addressed if your team is working to address it? Quiet in the chat. Unknown. Okay, so it's looking like so far we have a lot of maybe new SART coordinators. Um, so this is actually really great because it's good to start thinking about um, how power imbalances or how you plan to address power imbalances in your team. Um, so we've given you some suggestions today already, but it's worth bringing back to your team and figuring out the different ways you might want to share leadership or even power or address power imbalances that might exist between disciplines. So that's just something for you to think about. Um, you know, think about are there power imbalances when we're thinking of who's part of a SART, thinking about are there power imbalances between the community advocacy group and medical, or are there power imbalances between law enforcement and medical? Et cetera. Um, these are just some things to start thinking about. Um, kind of our second question, and I know we have a lot of new coordinators here, is how is leadership shared amongst your team members? There's some great comments in the chat too about power imbalances. Um, this is fascinating. A lot of uh... <laughs> A lot of teams that aren't really talking about it, which is not unusual. <laughs> um, and yeah, there are some teams where um, the folks with kind of traditionally the least amount of power are leading those teams. Mm -hmm. So that can also definitely make it interesting. Co-coordinators, it's a great, great idea for shared leadership. We have some chairs. We're asking folks to step up to step into leadership positions. Definitely. Co chairs. Yeah, so typically we do see that the SAR coordinator is taking up the majority of the leadership position. And 
at times it does make sense. Maybe your SART is funding this person to take on these roles and complete these tasks. Um, but it is something that worth thinking about is thinking about the ways you can share leadership amongst you know, other team members to really get um, not only their experience, but their interests um, to you know, incorporate that into the goals of your SART. Um, so it's just something to think about um, here. Okay, I think we can move to the next internal factor, which is culture of learning. So this is our next internal factor. Um, so a culture of learning emphasizes the importance of understanding the unique context of every situation. So what this kind of explores is that every survivor is unique and every single experience that a survivor might have is also unique. So it's really important that we understand that and are, current, are constantly learning. Um, and then we have documenting and examining or tracking and learning from successes and setbacks. So I'll talk about this actually in a couple of bullet points. Um, and additionally, there's continuously applying emerging strategies and then applying new information to the team's work. So for a SART, it's really important that a team and the team members are consistently seeking out um, information to better their understanding of individual and also community perspectives. So like I said, um, every survivor is unique, um, every individual in your community is unique, and your community in itself is also unique. So when you're um, creating an environment where learning is you know, fostered and um, encouraged, um, you're able to kind of better your SART work and um, better you know, the ideas and perspectives um, that your SART might come up with. Um, additionally, by creating a culture of learning, you're also creating an environment in which mistakes and setbacks are seen as opportunities for accountability and growth. Um, so this kind of looks at how, you know, not every individual knows everything about the response to um, sexual violence. Um, by fostering an environment where there is constant learning and happening, when mistakes do happen or where there is learning that needs to happen, um, that learning is instead encouraged rather than, you know, shamed. Um, so this is, you know, opportunity for your team to grow and individuals um, to grow. Um, positive outcomes related to this um, include just overall increased awareness of social positionality and how it affects the experiences of victim survivors in your community. Um, it also increases the openness to new ideas and perspectives. So because you're learning more or you're constantly seeking out learning, you might have new ideas that you can then um, you know, share with your team and then obviously um, create action steps to um, then do in your community. Um, and it also emphasizes again on the missteps as opportunities for accountability and growth. So I don't think this is a poll, but just some things to think about um, and things to help with creating a culture of learning um, is one, celebrate successes in your team. So this is really important um, because one, it encourages um, your team to, you know, continue doing work, but also celebrating when there are new ideas and perspectives. Um, an example of this is maybe doing a monthly award at each meeting. Um, and an award can be as small as, you know, a piece of candy. Um, we've had some SART teams that have, you know, larger funding and are able to provide gift certificates, etc. But again, you know, that depends on, you know, the structure of your SART. Celebrating success can be as small as doing shout outs at the beginning of each meeting or, you know, making kudos statements. Um, additionally, some things you can do to create a culture of learning is to encourage curious questions. So encouraging people to be able to ask questions will open the team up to new ideas and perspectives. 
Um, and then three, engaging with experts to share um, emerging practices. So overall, just like embracing opportunity to um, share and learn, not only from your local partners or your local agencies, but also your state level TA leaders and also your national experts. Um, this feels like a hint to say, reach out to us at SBJI, um, and it kind of is. Um, so you're always welcome to engage with us in you know, brainstorming um, potential emerging strategies um, that we've seen um, or maybe emerging strategies that you've noticed in your community. All right. So the next internal factor that we're going to talk about is continual evaluation and improvement. So this factor is closely tied to the three phases of systems change that SVGI uses through most of our work. Um, those of you who've seen our presentations before or worked with us before will be familiar with these. Um, we have, as you can see to the right, a, uh, a systems change model that is three steps, but is also kind of a continuous iterative process, starting with assessing the status quo. So looking at how things work on the ground right now, making the change, and then measuring the change. So looking at um, the changes that we made, were they effective? Did they do what we thought they would do? Um, did they create unintended, unintended consequences, et cetera? So again, that piece uh, where where we're continually evaluating and improving um, our response to determine effectiveness, to identify those unintended effects, um, any emerging issues that might be coming up. So is, is there a new law? Is there a new program? Is there a new uh, you know, factor in your community that is changing the landscape of the sexual violence response? Um, and also then what are some areas where we still need to work to improve? and long-term collaboration. So again, knowing that this is, a, this is a process that you're in for the long haul. Um, these teams are really um, encouraged to think about this process as not having a finish line. Um, it really is something that's ongoing that you are committed to, um, hopefully for the life cycle of either your agency or of the existence of sexual violence in your community. Um, just knowing that it's something that you will continue to work on. There are a lot of different ways that you can evaluate um, your system's response. You can do interviews with responders. So ask each other, ask the folks within your disciplines who are doing the work, how's it going? What, you know, what are you doing? What is a day-to-day, -day, what does a typical interaction look like with a victim survivor? What are some of the things that you're seeing? Um, where are there, where are you seeing gaps or missed opportunities with other collaborators? You can do group interviews. Um, so you can be talking with victim survivors to find out what, what is their experience? How are they affected by the system's response? How could it be better improved to make their life a little bit easier? You can do satisfaction surveys. Surveys are, you know, I think one of those really standard pieces we like to put into place. Um, they're sort of, it's sort of always good to have the option of a survey. I think people also are aware that whether or not, um, whether or not people respond to surveys can be really subjective, right? A lot of times um, when you put out a survey, the answers you're gonna get are the people who had a really good experience and a really, or a really bad experience. You're not gonna get a lot of those like, well, it was average right? You're going to get a lot of, I hated it, or, oh, this is wonderful. Um, so surveys are great. I think they're great to do in conjunction with some other evaluation options. Another piece you can do is something like a case file review. Um, and again, SVGI has a pretty intensive resource on what a case file review looks like. Um, and how we talk about it within SVGI is really not looking at individual cases specifically, but looking at groups of cases over a period of time and looking for patterns. So looking at closed cases that have um, kind of already been
in Jews like a one-time thing or is this something that we're seeing is happening um, consistently? So, sorry, my internet connection is unstable. Welcome to my world. So, um, one of the things that I will say about evaluation is that it's always good to do a lot of different types of evaluation to try to get the, mo the most and most accurate information you can. Um, particularly when you're trying to engage victim survivors, you don't want to overload folks, but you also want to make it easy for them to provide that information. You want to make an evaluation process accessible. So if you are asking to do interviews or focus groups, think about things like when you're holding those, um, are you, you know, are you doing it during the business day or at a time when folks are available? Are you providing compensation for those victim survivors to provide their information? Um, a lot of times we forget this, but survivors are subject matter experts. They have expertise and knowledge in this area, and we are, we are relying on them to really teach us things. And so providing the compensation that's appropriate for that is really important. And it really, I think, helps to reinforce the idea that this is a process that is really about the victim survivor and about improving their experience. So a number of positive outcomes uh, will occur with continual evaluation improvement. Um, the team's policies and protocols are going to evolve. Um, the routine practices will change. And some of that is because things change over time. Um, but honestly, like the thing that we run into is teams that get stuck because they're trying to get the perfect response, right? They're, they're working on their protocols, they're working together, they're trying to get it exactly right. And um, a lot of times that can get folks kind of trapped in that, in that place where we're, we're afraid to write it down and implement it because it might not be good enough yet. And with, with this particular factor of thinking about this continuous improvement, um, it's really important to just understand you're not gonna get it right the first time. You're just not. Um, because there are things that will not have occurred to you. There will be factors that come up that you could not have predicted. There will be situations that occur that have never happened before, right? Um, there will always be something in society changing, something within agencies changing. Um, you will have, you know, thought you solved a problem and somehow accidentally created a new one that you hadn't expected. So knowing that ahead of time really takes some of the pressure off. Um, it helps you to understand this is not a be all end all. You are not one and done. This is going to continue to be something that you're refining and working on over time. And that really helps because your community is changing and the, the needs that folks have are going to continue to change. So that flexibility is really important um, and beneficial to both the team members and agencies, but also to victim survivors. Um, it's also going to increase awareness of new or emerging issues in the community that your, your current SART work isn't addressing. So there might be, again, new laws or new, uh, I don't know, social media practices or, you know, some just community factor, social factor that is changing the way that the work looks on the ground. Um, and being both up to date on all of those things and then also able to adapt and respond to those changes is really important. It's also going to provide longer term and more active collaboration between members and member agencies. Um, since there is no finish line, the team doesn't have an end point. So this is something that's ongoing. Um, the team doesn't dissolve. It doesn't go defunct. It doesn't stop existing. Um, and that can come with its own set of challenges. Um, if you if you remain stagnant, if you're not making those changes and adapting and learning new things, um, but it keeps folks engaged when you're when you're frequently looking at, okay, now we've got this. Let's you know let's see how it's going. Let's talk about new things that are popping up. Let's share knowledge with each other. Let's bring in some experts to come and talk about things. Let's talk to people from other communities who are doing this work. Is there something that they're doing that's working really well that we might be able to use? Um, keeping all of those kind of 
ideas in your pocket for ways to keep the team engaged and keep the team motivated. Um, because I think for a lot of teams, especially when writing a protocol, it can sometimes feel like, okay, we're done. We don't have to meet anymore. You want to celebrate that win while also knowing that your work is not done. All right. Another poll that we're not going to pull. So we ask folks to uh, chime in in the chat. How comfortable are folks with evaluation? This is a fun question because evaluation is sometimes a tricky category. Yep. It's good to see that there are some folks who are really comfortable with overwhelming until you really break it down. Um, we think a lot about evaluation and ways to um, engage teams in evaluation that isn't going to scare people um, and get them to run away. <laughs> um, there are definitely there are definitely ways to do it that are less painful than others, but yeah, it, it often seems like an overwhelming task. How about capacity? How much capacity do your teams have at, at the moment to do this evaluation, to do it well? Um, to engage some of those different techniques we just talked about for evaluating. Capacity can be one of the bigger barriers with evaluation because most of you are doing this SART work on top of your, your other job, right? It's, a, it's in addition to not um, a replacement for other things. So evaluation can often take then time on top of that. Um, and you need to have enough folks with enough time to be able to dedicate. Um, and that can be really difficult. So that's something that the team, um, you know, can, can really be talking about, especially with um, agency leadership to say, you know, the evaluation part of this is really important. And we really need to find a way to dedicate some time to this. How can we do that? Um, yeah, attendance at meetings is sometimes difficult. Um, all of these things, capacity can be a factor. Um, but it's one of those things where when you're talking about having committed members um, and talking with the leadership of agencies to really hit home how, how key this piece is, um, how key this continuous improvement piece really is to the process. All right, the next internal factor is an emphasis on relationships and teamwork. And this is, this is probably like my favorite internal factor and the least favorite of a lot of the folks that we work with. Um, when we're talking about teams, we've got diverse membership um, with a lot of different viewpoints, experiences, um, attitudes, goals. Um, but this, this, team of, of disparate people needs to operate together collaboratively. And how do you do that? And there are some key factors um, that will help contribute to that. So one of the first is honesty. Um, tell, tell the truth about yourself and tell the truth to each other. Um, it's, it's, it seems very simple, but it's not something that we are historically great at. Um, and it fits into this next piece, which is open and consistent communication. I think um, a lot of times in our work, we are, we are expected to, to know what we're doing, know what we're talking about, always be on top of it, always have the right answer. And we feel a sort of pressure to, to get it right every time. Um, and when you're doing work like this, you're not going to get it right every time. There are going to be things that um, folks get wrong or where they miss the mark. 
there are going to be places where you might not have the answer, right? I think we're, we feel a lot of pressure a lot of times to, to have an answer. And you might have encountered, or you might be one of these people, I definitely have been in the past, someone who, if I don't know, I'll just sort of talk around the issue instead of just flat out saying, I don't know the answer to that, let me find out for you. Um, and that can be really, it can be really difficult, right? If you're asking a legitimate question, if you're really trying to solve a problem um, and folks aren't even able to acknowledge that they don't have that answer and that they need to find it, that can really be a barrier. So all of these things, just really being able to create the kind of atmosphere in your team where folks are comfortable telling the truth, where folks are comfortable saying what's really going on, admitting they don't know something, admitting that they need help with something, um, owning mistakes, all of that, um, communicating openly and consistently. So making sure that you are, you know, the team coordinators are telling people when the meetings are in advance, that you're sending out calendar invites, that you're sending out agendas, that you're sending, that you're sharing meeting notes, um, that you're talking about how we're working with each other and that the, the process for that is really clear. Um, the, you know, a place, we want this, this team to be a place where the conversations happen in the room. Um, a lot of times what'll happen is teams will, um, an issue will come up and it might be, you know, a little bit of a sticky issue and someone will say something and folks in the room will nod and agree and say, yeah, that sounds good. Great. And then after the meeting's over, there will be a second meeting in the parking lot where a couple people will say, that doesn't make any sense. And I can't, that's not going to work for us. So now you've just sort of negated what just happened in the meeting. You've agreed to something that no one's going to follow. And and what is the, what's the point of that? You've done nothing, right? So you really want your teams to get to a place where those difficult conversations can occur in the room, where you can say in the room, you know what, I'm not sure if that idea is going to work and here's why, and be able to talk it out with each other. Respecting differences. Um, and this is all types of differences, right? Every discipline has a different idea of what success looks like. So on a day-to-day -day basis, everyone's got a different goal, a different idea of what, what winning looks like, right? Law enforcement wants to make an arrest. Prosecution wants a conviction. Advocates are looking for, you know, victim safety. Sane nurses are looking for medical issues and physical health, right? All of these things are really important components. They're all different. Um, and it really depends on the team, it really, it, the team really needs to look at the victim survivor and say, what does this person, this victim see as a success? What do they need? What's a win for them? And focus on that. There are gonna be times when the thing that you think is most important isn't to that victim. So to be able to kind of collectively say, we are here for the, the good of this person, not the good of ourselves. We also need to have a team where it's okay to disagree, um, where it's okay to have a different understanding of a situation, where it's okay to talk through those different lenses. Um, one of the areas that this comes up a lot is just what is the definition of safety? What does safety mean to you um, versus your coworker versus someone else, right? Um, we sometimes don't think about the words that we use and the fact that other people might have a different understanding of what those words actually mean. And that goes into then this piece, which is active listening, just really paying attention to what each other are saying, um, trying to, to understand the meaning underneath and the intent underneath what people are saying in those meetings and what, um, what's being talked about, not just waiting for your turn to talk. Um, there's obviously a lot of really great things that can come when you've got a good um, emphasis on relationships and teamwork. It's going to improve communication between team members, member agencies, um, kind of all of those pieces of the feedback loop. And that's going to lead to more seamless and effective implementation. So you're going to, you're all going to be better 
able to do your jobs. Your jobs are going to be easier and the victim survivor's experience is going to be better if you're doing this well. You're improving relationships between member agencies. So again, um, as I was saying earlier about, you know, there might be some historical friction between different agencies. There might be um, some assumptions that agencies or organizations make about one another um, or a lack of understanding of what each other's roles are. So being able to um, work through those things and really understand what the what your purpose is and what everyone else's purpose is and how those things fit together can be really beneficial um, just in improving that working relationship. All of these things also then will increase the likelihood that your team is going to last and that your team is going to be able to be successful and make some really important changes in your community. So there's a number of different things you can do um, when you're thinking about building relationships within your team. Um, there, is, <laughs> there is a lot of resistance to some of these sometimes um, because they are often this sort of touchy-feely aspect of uh, teaming, but they are all really relevant and important. And you can, you can find ways to make, um, to make these pieces work with the group that you have. So one idea is to develop group norms. So that is just things like, how do we wanna interact with each other? How do we want to communicate with each other? How do we all want to show up in this space together? And that can include things like, you know, we agree to um, assume positive intent and acknowledge that impact is sometimes more powerful than intent. It could be, we agree to, sit back and let others talk sometimes if we're people who tend to talk a lot and vice versa. Um, kind of all of those things that you do, right, to, to talk about how do we want to share this space and how do we want to engage with each other. Creating networking opportunities. So sometimes it's really, you know, it's, it's tough because we're all very busy people and so it sometimes seems like an extra chore, but Teams really benefit from those opportunities, those kind of informal opportunities to talk to each other and get to know each other um, where you're not necessarily talking about working, about a process, just getting to know each other. And this can be, you know, an event, grabbing coffee or you're having a hair. It can all be as simple as having an icebreaker question at the start of the meeting that get you know gives people a chance to to share a little bit about themselves that's you know comfortable but but is maybe like off topic we like to do that within SGGI and we ask questions like if you were a superhero what would superpower be right something that's tells you a little about a person but isn't isn't too deep um isn't isn't too touchy feely Another way to build relationships is to model collaborative behavior. So if you've got some folks on your team who either individually or their agencies are working well together, highlight that, show people what that looks like so that they understand why this is gonna be a benefit to them. Um, I think a lot of times because we're busy and because we are so focused on what it is we need to get done throughout the day, that it's really important to, to actually be able to answer like, when someone says, what's in it for me? What, do I, what am I going to get out of participation in this team? What am I going to get out of engaging more fully in this team? And to be able to say to people, you're going to get some benefits. Um, and here's what that looks like. And here's how that'll make your life easier. Asking open questions. Um, so sometimes asking the room what they think and then waiting patiently for someone to talk. Um, so asking open questions and leaving space for those questions to be answered can be really important. And then incorporating team building activities. Um, and this is one of those areas where, again, I think a lot of people cringe when they hear a team building activity. Um, I personally never want to build another tower out of spaghetti ever in my life. I don't find that type of team building activity to be particularly helpful. But there are different kinds of things you can do for different groups. Um, and there are different kinds of things you can do based on what it is that you're trying to build. 
So if you've got a team that really needs to build some trust, find an activity that is, you know, safe and comfortable for folks that really emphasizes building trust, but that they can do at a level that they're comfortable with. Right. You, there's a there's a ton of different things you can do. Google team building activities and you will spend hundreds and hundreds of years on Google just looking at stuff. Um, and that is also something, again, SVGI, we are happy to help out if you're looking for ideas for team building activities um, or even just trying to figure out what what issues you want your team to work on together. OK, so. Now we've gone over all the internal factors and we've been talking for about an hour now. So I know we've given you a lot of information, um, but we're now gonna go over the four external factors. Um, and I think we'll go by these pretty quickly, but they'll leave room in the end for um, your questions um, or discussion. Um, so again, we so far have talked about all six internal factors. We talked about shared vision and model. Um, multi-level leadership, culture of learning, evaluation and improvement, um, diverse membership, and emphasis on relationships and teamwork. Um, like I said, we're now going to talk about the external factors, and those are actually the four large circles you see um, in that image on the slide. So we're going to talk about um, confident individual members. We're going to talk about supportive member agencies community support and input, and access to resources and networking. And Sarah mentioned this earlier, but just as a reminder, the difference between the internal and external factors in the frameworks is that the internal factors are part of the structure, um, the activities, and the culture of the team itself. Um, we're now going to talk about the external factors, which represent things that members, agencies, or community members um, can bring into the team from the outside. Perfect. So the first external factor that we're going to be talking about is confident individual SARP members. So each SARP member should feel confident in their professional role as a member of the team. This feels like a really big thing, saying that someone should be confident. Um, but this is really important because when team members are confident in themselves and their capabilities um, and also strengths, they're more likely or more able to effectively represent the perspectives of their agencies and disciplines. Um, They'll also have you know, the confidence to participate in meetings and the confidence to take on leadership roles. Um, we kind of talked about this in the internal factor, but when people are confident um, in their you know, ability to do this work, they're more confident um, in sharing you know, what they know or what they learned and also what they're good at. Um, um, additionally, it, you know, members will also be more likely to bring back the ideas of a SART back to their agencies. Um, consequently, the more confident a member is, the more likely they're able to also um, seek feedback from their agencies, but also more they'll be more confident to share it back to their SART. Again, this is kind of the feedback loop that I talked about earlier. Um, having a confident Member, it's you know a constant balance between confident, you know, being confident and also being humble. So you want a team member that's also, you know, confident in um, their expertise and knowledge, but also be willing to learn um, and also hear new perspectives. Um, kind of the positive outcomes related to this are. Um, when you have a positive team member, they're more able to actively participate and assume responsibility. Um, so we kind of talked about this again earlier, but if you have, for example, a team member that is really confident in doing evaluation, then they're more likely, um, you know, they're more likely and willing to sign up for maybe a leadership position. Maybe they're, you know, the ones that are raising their hand and saying, oh, I want to sign up and be the leader of this subcommittee. Um, this, you know, as you can see, also helps with multi-level leadership. Um, 
Another positive outcome of this um, is members will be more willing to share their thoughts and ideas um, because they're confident in themselves and again, in what they're learning and what they're you know, seeing in the field or seeing in the community. Um, another really important thing about this external factor is actually um, when you have a confident member, they're also more likely to um, or have the confidence to address disagreements. So this is really big. Um, it can be hard sometimes to address disagreements within a team because within a SART, it can actually be really easy to create a culture where group thinking is how decisions are made or how tasks are completed and checked. Um, when you have a confident team member, um, you're able to you know, have someone or people or members within a team who are more willing to stand up and share when they don't disagree uh, or when they don't agree with something. Um, another positive outcome is that when you have SART members that are confident, they're going to be more willing to go back to their agencies and share the work that's being done in the SART, um, which will then therefore, um, your SART will then be able to implement the work that's happening within the small group, but spread it within the agencies and also the community. Okay, um, the next external factor that we're gonna be talking about is supportive member agencies. Um, so now that we've talked about a lot of the factors, you'll see that this, a lot of this external stuff, it's actually tied to the internal stuff too. Um, but what we mean by this external factor is that all member agencies should be active and invested in the team. So in order for your team to be as effective as it could possibly be, it's really important that agencies are really fully committed to the mission of the team and to the implementation of its protocols and other systems change work. Um, I keep emphasizing this, but it's really important that, you know, as a SAR coordinator, um, you are checking in with your members to make and making sure that members are going back to their agencies um, and sharing the work for the things that are happening within a SART. Um, you know, as a reminder that I always like to say is that individual members are representative, representatives of their agencies. Um, it's really not enough for members or individuals to be invested. Agencies also have to be supportive of the work that's being done within the SART. Um, again, they'll overall help with the implementation of you know protocols or um, the work that your SART is doing. Um, so um, again, yeah, this leads to implementation and also increased support time and resources to the team. So if a member agency is aware of what's happening in the SART, then they're going to be more willing to support the work, right? Because they're not just learning at the end what's happening. Um, when they see that the member they're sending to the SART is also um, gaining a lot from it and sharing the good work that's happening, then a agency or discipline might be more willing to allocate time for that individual to not only participate, but do work outside of team meetings. Um, additionally, they might be able to provide different resources to the team. Positive outcomes related to this external factor is again, better and more consistent implementation um, of SART developed protocols, policies, and best practices throughout the member agencies. Um, there's also increased in team resources and you know, allocated time for the SART, and then um, overall increase in member agency participation. Um, a really important part of agency participation is um, that the agency leader, so the director is also aware of what's happening um, so that they can also share the information with their networks. All right, the next external factor we're gonna talk about is access to resources and networking. So teams really do need to have consistent access to resources from all over, local and uh, nationwide. 
um, resources and networks to get some support and to get some training. Um, a lot of times I think teams tend to work in isolation within their local communities. And the fact is that although every community is different, there are a lot of commonalities in SART work. And there are a lot of opportunities where you can learn from or build off of things that other folks are doing. So you're not having to reinvent the wheel every time yourself. So some examples of the types of resources that um, you should be kind of looking for or getting access to, things like training, um, looking for funding. So if you have a, a SART that doesn't have any or much funding to um, look for opportunities for that so that you can do things like reimburse mileage for people to attend meetings, um, pay for trainings, et cetera. Um, things like space and supplies also. So where, where are the meetings held? Um, what types of, of things do we need? Are we meeting virtually? And if so, do we all have access to, um, you know, a, a good, a, a good, <laughs> sorry, I'm having fun issues with my Wi-Fi, which is exactly the point that I'm trying to make. Do you all have access to the types of tech that you need to meet virtually? Um, some of the types of networking opportunities that we're talking about could be things like community events. So are, is your SART sponsoring uh, a community event? Are you um, setting up a table at your local county fair? Are you, you know, are you doing um, a, a, you know, a 10K or a 5K walk of some kind? Um, going to conferences. So there are you know, local, statewide, national conferences um, that are talking about the sexual violence response. And those can be really great opportunities for folks to learn and also for folks to meet other people who are doing this work. Um, it can also include things like online discussion groups. So that can be um, forums, that can be the SVJI listserv, um, it can be our connection calls, um, it can be other groups that you might participate in with folks um, either in your area or folks doing that work elsewhere. And all of these opportunities um, really help to increase the flow of new ideas um, and information, which is really key, especially when you're talking about that continuous improvement piece, right? You always want to be aware of what emergence, emerging issues and emerg emerging practices are coming um, into the forefront, that'll help strengthen that culture of learning that you're trying to create um, and help folks on kind of always be building their expertise, right? If you are able to bring in an expert to talk about an aspect of the response, folks are learning new things, they're getting better insights, they're figuring out how they can use those resources and that information to make their jobs easier and to, to do their jobs better. It can also, again, improve that collaboration and relationships between team members. Um, it helps to build relationships with folks like us and other TA providers, um, other SARTs, um, folks in your community who are interested in or concerned about the issues that your SART is working in. Um, it can also create opportunities for team members to get some new skills um, within their individual disciplines that can be really helpful not only for the team but for their own per for your own personal professional development right um so both within and, and external to the scope of the start itself and then the final external factor is community support and input so what this looks like is SARTs receive support and involvement from their communities and the communities feel invested and engaged in the work of the local SART. And that will improve the team's ability to respond directly to the community's self-identified needs. So a lot of times, um, you know, folks are part of a sexual assault response team in their community and, and the average community member doesn't necessarily know that that group exists, right? because um, the work is happening behind the scenes. It's, you know, you're, you're in the world of protocols and procedures and you're not necessarily front facing, but it can be really beneficial for SARTs and for the communities that you're in for folks to know what you're doing um, and to know that you exist and that there is a group of people 
working to make this better. Um, it can really help instill some trust and support in your individual systems. Um, and it can also really help the team then get that information from the community that they need to do their work better. So it helps, um, you know, it helps you achieve buy-in. It, it can sometimes, you know, if you have community support behind you, it can also help get engagement from reluctant members. Um, but you're also then just really able to understand what it is that the folks that you serve need from you. And this really has a lot of influence um, in how, how aware your community is of issues of sexual violence um, and some attitudes towards, towards both sexual violence and some of the cultural and um, you know, social factors that connect to that, but also to systems focused responses. So whether that be um, instilling a better understanding and trust of the criminal legal system, or whether that be just having a better understanding of, of how, you know, how SANE exams work, um, building that awareness and building that sort of community support behind the work you're trying to do is really beneficial. Um, it increases again, that awareness of present or emerging issues within the community. Um, so there, there might be things that aren't on your radar. Um, you might hear from folks in your local school district that something's going on, um, some, new, some new thing is happening with the youth in your community um, and you didn't know about it. And knowing it is an important um, piece toward being able to respond if something happens. So just having that better kind of ear to the ground on what's really going on day to day. It also really, um, it really increases access. It helps community members and victim survivors to know what resources are available. So, you know, if I think a lot of times we we try to be available. We assume that people know that we exist. Um, advocacy agencies know that if you, you know, if you Google rape crisis center, they'll pop up. Um, there's a lot of ways to connect in that way, but there are also folks who don't necessarily know that those services are available or that what is happening to them is relevant to that issue. So just really helping to, um, educate the community on what sexual violence looks like, what some of these issues are, and, and what resources are available can be really beneficial. Okay, so next steps. So we went over a lot. We've just gone over all um, 10 factors. Um, but what can you do with the information that we shared today? Um, what we always suggest is creating action steps. And unfortunately, we don't have time during this webinar um, to do it during um, you know, this allocated time. But something we recommend is first thinking about or listing the factors that you think that your team needs to work on. So for example, um, maybe your team might be interested in thinking about diverse membership or multi-level leadership, or maybe emphasis on relationships and teamwork. So after thinking about or listing the factors that you think your team needs to work on, then thinking about action steps. So what action steps do you need to take? Um, for example, let's think about diverse membership. Um, maybe you think that your team needs to um, add new members. An action step for that could be maybe connecting with um, the public schools and inviting them to a meeting. Again, this is based on the needs of your SART. Um, something you could do is map out who is in your community and figure out who you can reach out to and invite. Um, the next step is then setting deadlines um, and setting realistic deadlines, you know, deadlines that are that make sense with the goals of your SART um, and also your capacity. Um, as a SART coordinator, something that you can do to hold yourself accountable in this is sharing um, this action plan with your supervisor at your agency um, so that you, know, you can check in with them about how you're implementing some of these frameworks 
um, to better, um, you know, to have a better SART that is more effective and doing and accomplishing the goals that it's set for itself. So on the next slide, we actually kind of have an example of what this looks like. Um, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe this is actually from a SART coordinator in Minnesota. Um, and this might just be a screenshot that we had from one of our meetings with them. But as you can see this, yeah? <laughs> Yes, I have no idea if they met their deadlines, which were a year ago. I, I yeah, I'm also unsure. But <laughs> during when we did this presentation with some SAR coordinators in Minnesota, this one SAR coordinator said that they would like to work on diverse membership, multi-level leadership, and emphasis on relationships and teamwork. The action steps they set for themselves is connecting with the schools um, to achieve diverse membership. They said that they would create a checklist and assign a role for who would create that checklist and that was going to achieve their multi-level leadership um, and as you can see they also set deadlines from themselves from them for themselves um, that i'm hope, hoping and sure that they shared back with their agencies but this is just kind of an example of what you can do to use the information you learned at today's webinar and apply it to your current role as a SART coordinator um, and a strategy for a way to bring this information back to your team All right, so we only have about seven minutes left till 1.30, but if folks have questions, um, we are happy to take them now. Um, we can, if you wanna chat them in, um, we can do that. A lot of people have been asking. Um, so we will be sending out a um, link to the recording of this webinar. We'll also send the PowerPoint and we'll send a copy of the frameworks report. So you'll have all of those things and we'll send them to all folks who are able to register for this. Um, and I'll probably put it out on the uh, listserv that you may have also been added to. So any questions from anyone, uh, we are happy to take those and I'll put our contact information up as well. How often should do you think a SART team should meet? I think that is a really good question. It depends a lot on what the team is doing. Um, I think if you've got a SART team that is trying to write a protocol and you're in that process, I think um, monthly is monthly is a great rule of thumb. Um, sometimes you might have subcommittees or small groups that meet more frequently, but I think monthly is kind of a good a good standby. Um, if a team has an existing protocol and they're doing, they're kind of in that continuous monitoring and improvement area, that can sometimes be a situation where a team could choose to meet quarterly for, you know, a little bit longer each time. It really depends. Um, there's a lot of factors it depends on, right? It depends on the availability folks have on your team, um, what capacity do they have to go to meetings, how, how often is really convenient to meet. Um, it matters what work you're doing. Some teams need to meet more often than quarterly because if they only meet quarterly, it's like they have a brand new, like they're starting all over again every time because it's been so long between meetings. Um, I think monthly is like, we usually suggest monthly until like, until you realize you don't need it that often or until you realize you need it more monthly is a really good place to start. Um, but it really can be different. Um, and sometimes there are teams that have funding that also have um, requirements as to how many meetings per year they need to have. Other questions? All right. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, if you have additional questions or any support that you need, please reach out. That is literally our job is to be here uh, to help you out and answer questions you might have. Okay, another question in the chat. We have a sane nurse who isn't always available. Um, so victims have to sometimes travel out of town. Um, this, is a, this is a tough one. Getting new sane nurses can be difficult um, because not, every community has really kind of like enough capacity to support an entire SANE program. There are different training opportunities available for um, 
to train like regular healthcare providers, like non-SANE nurses in some of the um, medical forensic exam pieces. And Fatima, do you know, I feel like IAFN would be a really great resource to point people toward. Yeah, um, if you haven't already, one of our actual rural project partners is the International Association of Forensic Nurses, um, also known as IAFN. Um, but they are individuals who do a lot of training with nurses and actually do a lot of work um, when it comes to SARTs who are struggling with this exact issue. Um, I believe they also do have a training that trains um, other folks who are working in hospitals to just providing trauma-informed care to a victim survivor. Um, so we would love to connect you to those individuals. Um, Sarah dropped their link, but if you would like us to connect you directly, please do email Sarah or I, and we would be happy to CC you in an email with the technical assistance providers at IAFN. All right. Well, thanks everybody again. Um, I will be, like I said, I'm a, the goal is before the end of the week to send this email out to you all with a copy of the recording um, and all the materials. If you have questions in the meantime, please feel free to get a hold of us. Um, and it was great talking with you today. Have a great afternoon.